Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 125 in which we continue our look at the evolution of the crocodilomorphs with Dr. Tom Stubbs. Obviously, if you've not yet listened to the first part, episode 124, then you'll have to go back and do that first. But assuming you've now caught up, you should have a fairly good idea about the different crocodilomorph lineages and be ready to get stuck into their wider scale evolutionary patterns. Now, this episode isn't going to be a walk in the park, as we'll often be referring to the differences between diversity, which is the number of different species, and disparity, which is the differences between them all. And we're also going to be talking about paleoecologies, so that's how extinct organisms interacted with each other and their environments. And we've got geometric morphometrics, which is a complicated method of comparing shapes by analysing the relative positions of key anatomical landmarks between the different species. And we've also got a sprinkle of phylogenetics. So if you keep up with all that, you're doing incredibly well. And your reward is going to be a comprehensive understanding of what these fantastic animals were doing throughout geological time. Which were the most successful groups of crocodilomorphs? What drove their innovation and what's to stop crocs from diversifying again? Following on from last episode, we had a couple of donations to the show and so I just really want to say thanks for those. It's all really appreciated and we're saving up some pretty cool new equipment. And that's only because of such donations that we can do that. These all add up over time and we don't use them for anything other than improving the show and our overheads. And thanks also to everyone that helps with our exposure. A like on social media goes an incredibly long way, but comments and shares go that extra mile in terms of getting our posts up people's news feeds. So if you learn something new or if you have any requests for future episodes, leave us a comment. It all really makes a difference. Finally, on our website, we have the images that accompany this episode. And there you can look at diagrams and graphs that help explain what we're talking about. So don't forget to check those out too. Well, that's more than enough of me talking. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. So let us know what you think. So, turning to your study itself, you looked at the fossil record of crocodiles and sought to figure out how they all differed from each other and how and when these differences arose. So, what did the study actually look like, you know, day to day? What what were you doing and what kinds of data did you use? Yeah, so that's exactly right. So what, what we wanted to do initially was to provide a, a context of what what is the, the amount of variation that you see within crocodilomorphs throughout their, their 230 million year history. So when setting up this type of study, you have to think about how, how, how the scale of it works. So what, what part of the anatomy do we look at? Uh, how many um, taxa do we sample, et cetera, et cetera. So what we um, decided, uh, guided by, by other papers and guided by our, our past research, was that focusing on morphological variation in both the skull and the, the lower jaw, the mandible, uh, of, of these crocodilomorphs would be the best way to go because it makes the study more focused. Um, it means that we can look at a couple of very important aspects of anatomy and, and, and study them. So. On a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of what it looks like, so the first task was to um, uh, to collect photographs and images of crocodile skulls and jaws. So we did that using the combination of museum visits, uh, discussions with with colleagues and friends who who work on crocodiles and um, extinct crocodilomorphs. Uh, sometimes using images from the literature if they were of uh, good enough quality. And we, we collected this large database of, of images of crocodile skulls and jaws. Um, I think we ended up with about 240 skulls and about 205 lower jaws. So this is from the entire fossil record and sample of living crocodiles as well. So 
obviously we were able to include all all living crocodiles because they're known from from modern modern samples of, of recently dead crocodiles but we were able to get a large number of fossil skull and jaws as well and that, this makes um this study was actually i think the largest study of of morphological variation in crocodile morphs we were able to include so many um uh, fossils uh, in it once we had these images of these crocodile skulls and jaws we then wanted to measure basically how different the sample was we wanted to look at we have all these crocodile skulls and jaws from their entire history how do we get an idea of how different they are how do we decide what are the most most weird forms and what are the most average forms so to do that we used what's called shape analysis so we used um, a method called geometric morphometrics which is where you you position landmarks and, and curves on the images of the fossils that you have and doing that you can capture the the, the shape variation so for example in in the in the jaw we, we selected a, um, a sample of landmark points and, and you position them on every one of your jaw samples and then when you do that across all 200 um, jaws you can then get an idea of of where the um, variation lies, so where you find most of the morphological disparity, which is the, the term that we use, which basically means the the diversity of the morphology. And we did this for both the skull and the jaw. So, in terms of on a day to day basis, it was a, a large amount of data collection, visiting museums, speaking with colleagues, searching through the literature, and then it was a large amount of time. Um, collecting this landmark data. So this was all done digitally uh, on a computer, positioning these landmarks. And then once we'd done that for all of our samples, so both of the skull and of the jaw, we were able to then move on to the analyses where we could synthesize all that data and get an idea of where all the variation was and which groups it belonged to, when, when crocodiles were most diverse and when some groups evolved faster than others. So is, is the skull alone uh, a reliable proxy for its ecology? So I know we talked before about the, the three morphotypes of modern uh, crocodile morphs. So we'd look at the broad-snouted alligator, the kind of pointy crocodiles, and the long, thin uh, gharials. Um, so does... Is that alone, that shape alone, reliable for determining how they lived? So we can just effectively disregard the rest of the body? Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. So yeah, that's a very important point. So one thing that our study focuses on is this concept of ecomorphology. So it's all terminology, but basically what we're trying to do is, is analyze variation in, in morphology that has a clear ecological signal. So you're very right to point out that studying a, a single element of the anatomy could potentially be risky. So you, you, can, you can potentially miss a large amount of information by only studying one part of the, uh, of the body, basically. Thankfully, in crocodiles, we have a lot of knowledge about how their, their skull shape links to their diet, um, diet being the focus here in terms of their, their niches. So there's studies going back to the 70s and 80s where people have done biomechanical analyses showing that the different morphotypes seen in modern crocodiles have very clear uh, biomechanical um, relationships. So if you have a very slender snout, that massively affects the, the resistance to bending when biting and, and things like that. So whereas if you have a very robust skull, which is wider and deeper, they have greater resistance to bending. And this then ties very closely to ecology in terms of feeding. So that's more the focus of our study. Um, rather than it being about things like locomotion or habitat, it's more about dietary ecology. And in that case, I do think that the skull works well. I should add an additional caveat that this is a thing linked to, to crocodiles. So because we have this great amount of knowledge about crocodile skulls in terms of their biomechanics, it gives us a powerful tool for using their, the skulls of their um, extinct relatives um, with being able to tie that all together. In other groups, the, the link might not be so clear. I, I think 
based on general knowledge, I think that generally the, the morphology of the skull does link to ecology in lots of animals. So maybe in things like carnivore and mammals, if they have more robust skulls, they can eat bigger and harder prey generally. I should also add that, um, as you know, we didn't just look at the skull. And as I mentioned, we also looked at the jaw. So we did this because we wanted to have two proxies of ecomorphology, basically. We wanted to see if, if you studied the skull and jaw, would they show the same pattern of evolution? Um, would they both show clear ecological signals in, in the morphological variation that we see? And I won't expand on it too much now, but basically the results that we get from the skull are very similar to the results that we got from the lower jaws. So when, when you had this morphological variation in one of those elements, you tend to see it in the other. And I guess that's kind of what you'd expect as, as animals change their ecology and uh, through time you see changes in both the, the upper skull and then the lower jaw. So yeah, I, I think that skulls and jaws are, are reliable proxies of ecology in crocodiles with the caveat that that is more in terms of their diet rather than things like locomotion. Obviously, you, you can't get very much about how an animal moved through on land or through water from its skull. Um, you need to look at their their limbs and their and their and their postcranial anatomy in order to really get at that. Yeah, well, I guess the 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 skull and the jaw is really the the business end of a crocodile. And um, yeah, do, do you actually know um, are most crocodile species in the fossil record uh, identified uh, from um, details of the skull? And what is there? Is there a preservational bias? Like it's more common to get skulls preserved than than bones uh, in the rest of the body. And then, if you do have bones from the body without a skull, is it possible to identify that as a new species? Yeah. So you're, you're right to highlight that a lot of crocodilomorph taxonomy, the the kind of science of naming new new species is based around variation in the skull. It's not exclusively, though. You, you do sometimes find um, entire fossil skeletons, including both the skull and the postcranial skeleton. Uh, you also find kind of partial skulls and partial postcranial skeletons. And yeah, you're right. that If, if you were to survey the entire fossil record of, of crocodiles, you'd find that most have a skull. Um, whereas relatively few would be described only on on their kind of limbs or their backbones, uh, or even parts of their their limbs or backbones. But um, in terms of a preservation of bias, I guess you could argue that because um, generally crocodile skulls are quite robust, although not all of them are. Uh, some of them are, are quite gracile. But if you think about fossil alligators, a lot of their skulls are, are very kind of chunky and, 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 and big. So they, they tend to preserve quite well, um, where I imagine if, um, as, a, as the animal died, it would be easier for its uh, limbs and its backbone to get disarticulated and um, get spread around. So potentially linking a fossil skull to a, to a, a, a postcranial skeleton, if they were found in the same formation or something, um, would be tricky. Uh, you just have to see whether the, the postcranial skeleton had, had similar features of the of the of the phylogenetic group that the the school belonged to. Thankfully, though, the fossil record of crocodiles is is, is good. So, I know that's quite a um, a vague meaning because what what do you mean by good? It's kind of how long is a piece of string, but it's it's, it's very rich. Uh, there's there's over six hundred fossil species, and they're found from all over the world. There are some biases in terms of geography. You, you find more fossils in certain parts of the world um, and you find fo more fossils at certain times. But thankfully, for the purpose of our analyses, we were able to capture the main morphologies present in all time intervals, which is a, an important thing when you study morphological variation. When you're studying morphological variation, it's not so important that you capture everything, every single species. It's more important that you capture all the morphologies that were around at any one time. Um, you don't want to miss out a, a potential important um, animal just because the, the fossil record doesn't preserve it, because that would potentially bias your your measures of, of variation through time. I was going to pull you up on bias. I was I had a question ready to go, but you've already answered that. So 
Well done. Well done, you. You got in there first before I could grill you on it. No, I agree. Um, it's, it's a very important thing to consider, and especially when you're doing these really big analyses across time and, and whole whole clades. It's something that should always be in the back of your mind, really. Mm -hmm. Right. So looking at the results then, um, in which period uh, were the crocodiles, crocodilomorphs the most disparate? And by disparate, uh, I think it's good to de um, define these terms. So um, we have the number of individual crocodiles. Uh, so yeah, that's just how many there are around. You have the diversity, which are, we'll say is the number of species. And then you have the disparity, which um, in this instance, we're talking about uh, morphological disparity. So that would be the differences in shapes and anatomy between them all. So in which period is there the biggest difference between their morphology, their shape? Yeah, so yeah. Um it's important to make that distinction between those those three different metrics and yeah our study is focused on the latter it's focused on on morphological variation or, or disparity and we find that um, crocodilomorphs were most variable during the cretaceous so if you take their entire fossil record goes from the late triassic about 230 million years ago to, to obviously modern times we find that they had the greatest variation during, during the cretaceous if you were to put absolute ages on it, it's probably from around 110 million years ago to about about 70 million years ago. So that's quite a large period of time when you think about it, like 40 million years or so. But that was an interval when crocodilomorphs were very diverse, uh, very disparate, sorry, for a, for a long period of time. They had sustained high disparity. So throughout that entire time, there was a great um, variation in both the anatomy of their skulls and of their jaws that's an important distinction as well that we, we found the same pattern in both the skull and in the jaw morphology so you had this this long interval of very high disparity during the cretaceous and then presumably ecology off the back of that disparity yeah so was that when yeah was that when you had the most crocodilomorphs doing the most different things yeah, so yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I think that's what we find. Um, it's, it's a combination of things, really. This high disparity in the Cretaceous was accompanied by great ecological variation. So you had marine crocodiles around at that time, things like um, the, the, the Tethysusians, like there's a group called the Dirosaurids. They were a marine crocodile group. And then you had the, the Notosusians on the land. So that's a group that I, I've mentioned before, which actually contribute massively to disparity during this this high plateau. Uh, the Notosusians were incredibly disparate, so they did evolve lots of different ecologies, including herbivorous and omnivorous diets, and obviously carnivores as well. And this great eco ecological variation was associated with very high disparity. You also find that the, the Cretaceous was a time of oddities in, in the Cretaceous, crocodile more fossil record so there was lots of lots of weird and wonderful forms found during this time and these expand morphospace so that's that's a term that we haven't used so much so far morphospace is basically like a, a map of morphologies where you can visualize the the differences between and between forms between shapes and uh, the closer two points are in morphospace the more similar they are and if you have a very, very expansive morphospace with, with big differences between, between taxa, that would give you very high disparity, very high variation. And that's what we find throughout the Cretaceous um, from about 100 to about 70 million years ago. So, and in fact, right, maybe right, right, right up to the end of the Cretaceous, so right up until 66 million years ago, you found very high amounts of, of disparity, both in the skull and in the jaw. So that morphospace, I'm I'm just imagining, um, like we would uh, with the modern ones, the broad flat snout, the pointy snout, and the long snout. If you like, make a triangle between those, just mentally those shapes, and just plot them on a little graph, and then you can plot any kind of uh, shape in between those within that triangle. It falls within there. If you expand that morphospace if you had say like the pancake 
shaped uh, jaw, then that triangle might become a square or it might become a different shaped triangle. And so it's kind of a an imaginary 2D shape into which everything can plot. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So it's a, it's a visualization of the variation. So in um in the example you gave, yeah, that's kind of looking at how variation exists within a within a spectrum of of, of snout shapes, and that's kind of what what a morphospace is. Um, here, our morphospace isn't defined based on those simple morphotypes. It's defined based on the 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 full variation that we see within that the landmark data. So you remember I mentioned that we captured um, the the shape of the snout and skull and the shape of the jaw using these landmarks. So it kind of gives you a projection of all all variation that you see. And then what you can do is you can visualize um, at any one time how much of that space is occupied out of all, out of all potential morphologies that were seen um, based on that landmark data, how much was occupied at any one time. And as perhaps unexpectedly, you find that the crocodilomorphs from the past occupied different areas of morphospace to those that modern crocodiles occupy. So they the, there are areas of morphospace that um, modern crocodiles don't 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 revisit or they don't occupy compared to their extinct relatives. So things like the notasutians, they occupy both very wide morphospace and also a very very distinct area separated from lots of other crocs. And that's because they evolved these mammal-like skulls and jaws that were associated with their their weird and diverse niches. Okay, so this this is sounding like the kind of thing that you need a PhD and a very powerful computer to run. But essentially, in my head, I'm seeing as like keeping it as simple as that triangle that we had before um, through time the shape of that triangle might change or then other um, different types of crocodile might start to form their own little shape off to the side of it. And yeah, taking slices through each of the periods, each of these different shapes, these islands of morphospace will change, get bigger, get smaller. And that reflects the, the different shapes in the skulls and then what each of those crocodiles were doing and how they were living. Yeah, so yeah, so that's that's another way of kind of visualizing it or, or imagining it. Yeah, as as different groups evolve and they expand to to di into different niches, they they could either fill in the same morphospace that has already been seen before, or they could expand into new areas of morphospace and um, expand the full range of morphologies that, that you see in the group. Um, and that's actually what we see. That's one of the main main things we show in our in our analyses that. Some of the 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 crocodilomorph groups from the past that diversified to uh, into more odd niches, they they expanded morphospace and occupied very specialized areas of it as they um, expanded their their ecology and their and their diet. So, how did this this disparity, the the differences in the shape, develop? Um, did it just creep slowly, or did it? you know, absolutely did explode in uh, disparity at a given event, like after an extinction. And are the two related? What we see in our analyses is that the disparity of um, crocodilomorphs steadily accumulated through time. So there wasn't really a, a massive expansion at any one point. So be beginning in the late Triassic, there's there's a, a steady accumulation of disparity through the Jurassic and uh, through the Triassic and then into the Jurassic, and then it reaches a, a kind of high plateau in the Cretaceous. So rather than it being a, a, like a spike of of morphological variation being being very great, it's kind of a, a steady accumulation of of disparity through time, and then it reaches this this high plateau for, throughout the Cretaceous, and then what you see is that that plateau then then declines so once you go into the the paleogene um, and the neogene so after the uh, end cretaceous mass extinction you see a, a, a steady decline in disparity so disparity reduces from the levels that you saw in the cretaceous to to disparity levels that were more similar to the jurassic and the triassic so this this decline in disparity 
it, it begins around or just before the, the end of the Cretaceous, and then disparity stays at a steadily um, moderate level, I'd say, throughout much of the last 60 million years. Oh, wow. It surprises me uh, that they seem to be unaffected by a lot of the things that are going on. So, you know, you've got a steady increase through the Triassic. We're getting more and more different forms of crocodile. Then kind of hiatus in the Cretaceous, which is where we've got our biggest amount of disparity. And then they they don't get hit by the extinction event to the same level as the dinosaurs you know you've got this massive um meteor asteroid hitting and they don't seem you don't see this massive drop off this massive cliff edge but it's just more of a general gentle decline in diversity uh, disparity i find that really surprising yeah so it's quite a, it's quite a moderate a moderate drop off it's not it's not a very sharp drastic um wipe out of all morphologies um what you i guess the what you do see at the end of the cretaceous is is a reduction in the number of notasutians so this is again this this important clade that i've mentioned of of land dwelling crocs so they do actually go pass through the extinction events and they they're still around in the paleogene but uh, their their num- their their diversity and their disparity is greatly reduced and and with that the overall disparity of crocodilian morphs also declines. You don't see any more herbivorous uh, notasutians in, in the paleogene. The only ones that are left are, are, are land-dwelling carnivores. And that, that disappearance of the Cretaceous um, herbivorous and omnivorous notasutians is probably what, what leads to that steady decline in disparity through time. So that's probably the, the biggest impact that the extinction event might have had. It, it may have been responsible for reducing the diversity and therefore the disparity of those weird herbivorous notasutians. But l- like you said, it, it wasn't a dramatic disappearance or catastrophic event. It was more a perturbation, I guess, but without a full, full-on wipeout. And then um, the disparity that you see in, mo- in living crocodiles, so... We we have like a time series of of disparity through time, which it's basically like a little wiggle that goes up and down, and it it shows you when disparity was greatest and lowest. We see the disparity in in the Holocene, which is obviously the most recent, the current uh, geological time interval. Uh, disparity at this time is low. Um, it's not the lowest at any point through crocodile evolution, though. It, it, but it's um, much lower than it was in the Cretaceous. But still, it's not dramatically lower. So it's not like there's an exponential decline in disparity through time. It's more of a a moderate drop in disparity, which I was slightly surprised by because we all, like we talked about before, uh, people often describe modern crocodiles as being quite boring and being quite samey. But they 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 do in those three morphotypes that we've talked about the the slender snouted, the the U shaped snout, and the V shaped snout. That still is is quite a, um, a wider range of morphologies. It's obviously no way near what it was during the Cretaceous, though, when you had all those other uh, weird and wonderful forms. But yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't an exponential decline in disparity. It was more a steady petering out to, to more moderate levels uh, uh, today. So why has it remained that moderate level? We know that. Uh, crocodiles in the past have done some weird and wacky things. What what's preventing them from doing it again? Yeah, so that's a very important question, and that ties into both the the disparity aspect of our study and also the evolutionary rates that we'll discuss maybe a bit later. But um, what we find is that these times of great disparity. Um, and also the the evolution of weird and wonderful jaw shapes and skull shapes is often tied to the evolution of more specialised ecologies and niches. So, for example, the the expansion of marine crocodiles in the Jurassic, Jurassic was associated with the evolution of very long snouts, and then they within that group they innovated a little bit more and they became more robustly jawed and whale like rather than like a, a long snouted dolphin. And then in the the notasutians during the Cretaceous, 
they expanded into ecologies that are obviously not occupied by crocodiles today. So I think that this is what underpins all of crocodile morph evolution. I think it's the availability of ecological opportunities, which are one of the major driving forces in the, the distribution of biodiversity through time, both, both species diversity and morphological disparity. I think that modern crocodiles and, and crocodiles from the last 60 to 80 million years never reached the, the heights of the Cretaceous because they're more restricted in their ecologies. For example, there, there are no, well, there's only one marine crocodile today, the saltwater crocodile, and it basically looks the same as a Nile crocodile, really. It doesn't have paddle-like limbs or, or um, a fin on its back or anything odd like that. You also don't see any land-dwelling crocodiles, really. Sometimes you see them lumbering around on land, but there aren't any badger-like crocodiles anymore or cat-like crocodiles anymore. And that's because they're more restricted in their ecology. They, they occupy this, this niche as being predatory animals in wetlands and on rivers. And restriction to that niche, I think, is what has caused the, the reduction in disparity within the group. They're kind of fixed within these limited ecological niches. And whenever you see crocodiles expand to a, to a more specialized niche in things like the gario, well, that is where a lot of the variation occurs. So the evolution of the long, very long and slender snout in the gario is, is, is the, most, the biggest element of morphological variation within modern crocodiles. And that's obviously a very a different niche because garials are adapted to eating fish and, and stuff, uh, small bodied prey. So I think what underpins disparity through time within crocodiles and their entire evolution is, is this availability of, of ecological opportunities, such as expanding within novel niches and novel habitats and evolving new diets. Okay, so it'd be fairly hard for an aquatic ambush predator, such as a Nile crocodile, to start um, walking about on land doing something that one of its ancient relatives would have done because it's too much of a jump and because there are already things like lions and whatnot wandering around. There's not that available space for them to fill ecologically. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's that's perfectly summarised it, really. So I think it's a combination of um, maybe having more limited morphological variation and also being... Uh, having much greater competition today. So obviously um, there was lots of competition um, in the past. So the the marine crocodiles that existed during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, they existed alongside things like ichthyosaurs and um, plesiosaurs. And the land crocodiles of the past, the notasutians, they would have existed alongside lizards and dinosaurs. So it's not like they were always within empty niches. There were, there's always been competition, but it seems that for the last 60 to 80 million years, crocodiles have been sidelined a little bit towards these more restricted ecological niches. And I'm, I think that might be something for the future. We could potentially discuss this later, but that might be something for the future, kind of tying in how this, this limited um, ecological niche expansion has, has affected them and, and why. It could all be due to their physiology because – Crocodiles are cold-blooded and um, their, their competitors aren't, so that might be a, a physiological restriction on their expansion to it, to these more uh, specialised ecologies like living on land or living in the oceans. Do you, do you have a measure for how quickly they can evolve if they had that space to evolve into? I don't necessarily. We don't necessarily have a metric for how quickly they could evolve should the space become available, but we do have more general metrics of how fast um, a group evolves or how fast um, crocodiles evolve through time. This is where yeah. you look. You look at their their evolutionary tree and you look at the amount of morphological change that happens along the branches, and you see whether that amount of change is what you would expect given uh, a basic model of evolution. And if you see faster evolution than what you would expect, that, that points towards basically fast evolution, uh, kind of variable rates, they call it. So it points towards a shift in, in, in evolution so they can evolve more fast. 
in terms of linking that to future opportunities, that would be quite tricky. I guess you could you could potentially simulate new crocodiles that expanded to it expanded to terrestrial environments and see if they would evolve faster fit in them. That would be like a simulation study. That would be potentially quite interesting as a as a thought exercise. No, but I'm talking about in the past. Can you tell how quickly the crocodiles evolved at any given time? Yeah, so that's that's the the the, the kind of second facet of our study. So when you're looking at um, evolution through time, there's, there's there's two real aspects. There's what we'd say the the mode and the tempo. So the mode of evolution is is the pattern. So that's the the disparity through time wiggle, which tells you when the group was the at most uh, had the greatest disparity. The second facet is the idea of tempo, and that's the the process that generates this disparity through time that you see. And this is where our study really shines in a way, because um, people have looked at disparity in crocodiles before uh, a few times, but our study is the first to look at um, the, the speed of evolution in terms of these, these eco-morphological proxies, which are the, the skull and the jaw shape. So that, that's the, the real big novel thing of, of our new work. Um, in addition to it being the, the largest study of, of crocodile uh, ecomorphology and evolution, it, it's this evolution of, um, the, it's looking at the speed of evolution, which really makes our, our study novel. And like I've, I've mentioned, that, that involves looking at the phylogeny, the, the evolutionary tree of, of the group. And then you, you quantify how fast things evolve across the tree. And that allows you to identify both time periods and groups that evolve faster than, than others. It even allows you to look at individual branches within an evolutionary tree where the, the speed of evolution is greater than what is expected. And looking for these, these rate shifts, you can, you can tie in uh, expansions of, of ecology and, um, and of evolutionary niches to how the shapes changed. And that's the, the, the kind of the key, the key aspect of our work, um, trying to look at how fast things evolve through time and how fast different groups evolved. So essentially with the study, you could, for instance, look at the marine crocodiles, see how different they are to each other and see how quickly they were able to fill that marine environment. And equally um, with the terrestrial one, how quickly um, new forms were able to arise uh, and how different those were from each other. Yeah, so that's exactly what we did. So when we studied um, this, this rate of evolution, the, the, the speed of evolution, we, we, first, we did it across the entire tree, obviously, um, but then when you look at the, the distribution of, of fast evolutionary rates across the tree, you can start to pick out um, either groups or, or individual um, animals that evolved very fast. And when we did this, um, there, was a, there was a few striking results. First of all, across the entire crocodilomorph tree, you see quite a lot of um, kind of sporadic instances of fast evolution. It, uh, fast evolution isn't restricted to just one group um, or one branch. You find it distributed across the tree. But very importantly for, for our work, and I guess for understanding crocodilomorph evolution, we found very, very clear evidence that you had faster evolution in both the skull and the jaw when crocodilomorphs evolved these more specialized ecologies and niches. So in the um, in the the aquatic, uh, sorry, in the marine crocodilomorphs, the, what are called the phalatosuchians and the, the dirosaurids, don't worry so much about the names, it's more, these are two groups that evolved to be fully marine, so these existed within the oceans. Our work sh shows very clearly that these groups evolved very, very fast. So both in their skull and in their jaw shape, they, they underwent very fast change. What's also kind of significant is that when you evolve to a new niche, you, you expect morphology to change to kind of a new form. So, for example, once um, as crocodile morphs evolved to, to go within the water, we saw a, a very rapid elongation of their snouts and their jaws also became more gracile. This made them more hydrodynamic. Uh, when you think about trying to snap fish in, in the oceans, having a very uh, slender skull and a very slender jaw uh, in, in, improves that efficiency. 
But what we also found within the Flatosuchians, these marine crocodiles, was that they didn't just, just settle on this single morphology. They actually carried on evolving quite fast. And that's when you have the evolution of these more whale-like uh, marine crocodiles, those Flatosuchians that had more robust jaws and mo more robust skulls. So it's that continued innovation that perhaps is linked to their success. It wasn't just like a burst of evolution as they invaded the oceans. It was they invaded the oceans and then they continued to innovate. They evolved snapping jaws for eating fish, but they also evolved more robust jaws and more robust skulls for eating larger other marine animals, so other marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs and things like that. And this continued innovation is reflected in, in a sustained uh, interval of rapid evolution. So and maybe over the course of about 40 to 30, maybe even to 50 million years, Flatosuchians, the, the marine crocodiles, were evolving faster than, than the, the background rate of evolution, so faster than, than what you saw across the rest of the uh, croc crocodilomorph clade. The same principle also applies to the Notosuchians. So we talked about them again, um, the, the terrestrial um, crocodiles from the Cretaceous. We also find within Notosuchians that you had this sustained rapid evolution. So this was over the course of maybe 80 million years. They were evolving very fast. So it wasn't just one phylogenetic branch. There was this huge leap of rapid evolution and this huge shift in, mor in morphospace uh, and the evolution of new new forms. It was continued innovation throughout the group. They evolved these mammal-like skulls and jaws, but some of them evolved different morphologies. Some of them evolved quite long-snouted morphologies. And within the Notosuchians, you see herbivores, omnivores, you see large-bodied um, aquatic carnivores, you see terrestrial carnivores. So this... This is a very clear signal that within these specialized groups from the Mesozoic in particular, you see rapid evolution uh, as they expand to these more specialized ecologies. And that's showing a clear link between ecological opportunity and the, the tempo and, and mode of evolution in, in crocodile morphs. Basically, when, when they had a chance to expand, they were able to take it. And it wasn't that they just settled for a single morphology within this new niche. They they continued to innovate and continue to expand, evolving more complex jaw shapes and more complex skull shapes as they as they kind of tested all these different niches within these habitats. That pattern of evolution is is a is a stark contrast to what you see within the the crocodilians. So I'm I'm using another technical term there, but crocodilians is basically the, the modern families of, of crocodiles. So it's the, the gharials, the alligators, and the crocodiles. The, the, so things like the Nile crocodile. These, these three families all originated, they originated about 100 to 80 million years ago. And what you found within crocodilians, or crocodilia, the, 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 the technical name of the, the clade, they actually evolved more moderately for, for their entire history. So since about maybe 70 million years ago, they've, they've been evolving steadily. I wouldn't say that, that crocodilians have been evolving slowly, which is what you might expect if they were living fossils. They've been evolving kind of similar to the background rate of, of crocodile morphs throughout their entire history kind of a, a moderate intermediate level of, of evolution in terms of how fast they were changing. So that links to the earlier question that we had from, from, from one of the viewers that um, have, have crocodilians, modern crocodiles, been changing much through time. The answer to that is that they have, but it's been a more, a more moderate pace. It's been kind of a steady evolution, steady change through time. And this, this change has all happened within a bound of... of, of more simple morphologies, those three morphotypes that we've talked about. What do you think the really the take home message of this study is? The main thing I wanted to get across was this this link between ecological opportunity and expansion in those extinct groups, and also the fact that their 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 evolutionary mode was very different to the the modern families. It's this kind of it's like there was a there was a clear shift in evolution in crocodilomorphs from being 
opportunistic in terms of expansion uh, in, in morphology and ecology towards being more restricted and more moderate, I guess, fixed within the bounds of, of a certain range of ecologies that, that limited their morphological variation. And that, that, that shift between opportunistic expansion um, linked to ecology and being more restricted, I think that, that kind of underpins all crocodilomorph evolution. And that, that's one of the key points of our work. One, the real novel thing that we show is this, this shift in evolutionary tempo and evolutionary mode, which underpins the, the entire clade. It kind of explains their, their rise and their fall. So then to conclude, um, why are these kinds of studies important? So we know that crocodilomorphs were diverse in the past and that they had all of these disparate shapes. Why is that significant? I think one of the, the key questions in evolutionary biology is, is why does biodiversity rise and fall? Um, like we talked about earlier when we discussed my research interests, that, that, that is pretty much what, what fascinates me about, about evolutionary biology. Why, why does diversity go up and down through time? Why is it unevenly distributed across the tree of life? And understanding those, those patterns, I think, is really key. It's especially key kind of scientifically, understanding why groups rise and fall and why biodiversity is uneven. And that, in a way, can help us understand the evolution of modern biodiversity as well. It's kind of a thing that all paleontologists try to do. They often try to justify what they do by talking about conservation and, and modern and modern biodiversity. But I think understanding what 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 allows clades to to expand and what potentially causes them to decline uh, using these these ancient and diverse. Uh, fossil groups which have living members, I think that is a really important aspect of paleontology and of evolutionary biology. And in terms of crocodiles more, in, more specifically, I think they're a very important group today. Although although we talked about their low diversity, crocodiles are still apex predators and they're, they're really key in their ecosystems. If, if you removed crocodiles from the world today, it would, it would be terrible for ecosystems. Um, there was even a recent paper about this last year, kind of a review of of the importance of crocodiles. So understanding how their morphology today compares to their past, I think gives a nice context, context of how they kind of reach the point they're at now. And what our work was able to do was able to really characterize the evolutionary history of crocodilomorphs and really pinpoint where there was this shift in, in their evolutionary tempo and mode. So are there any questions still left unanswered about their evolution? Yeah, I think there's lots of unanswered questions about, about crocodile evolution and um, crocodilomorph evolution uh, more widely. So I think trying to link diversity in terms of the numbers of species, morphological variation in terms of what we talked about today, and also uh, external drivers of evolution, such as climate change, Linking those three together in, in, a, in a numerical way, I think, is really important because what was kind of absent from our work was any, any data on external drivers such as temperature or sea level or any p possible things that could link to the, the speed of evolution. So trying to integrate the kind of external drivers of evolution together with what we actually see happening in crocodilomorphs will be really important. I also think that, um, yeah, you could also apply similar methods to what we did to the skull and jaw, to other aspects of, of the crocodilomorph body plan. So you could potentially study the, the disparity and the, the, the speed of evolution in their, in their postcranial skeleton that might give you more of an indication of uh, kind of locomotion and habitat expansion. Yeah, it sounds like a, a lot of work still to do. So you might need an army of students to do that, new PhD students. So what would you say to someone who would consider studying crocs or or indeed using some of the same uh, methodologies that you've used in your study? I think, yeah, definitely using um, crocodilomorphs as a model for evolution and, and using crocodilomorphs as a way of testing major trends is definitely a very fruitful exercise. 
lots of people work on birds and mammals with very obvious why they're they're very diverse they're very variable but crocodile moths provide a very very different insight into biodiversity through time and i would definitely encourage people to study them in terms of the methods so yeah the, the methods that we've used here are a combination of the new and the old so shape analysis of, of skulls and jaws is is not a new thing it's it's a very well well applied technique and it, it's it provided very novel insights into eco-morphological evolution of, of lots of different clades so i really love shape analysis being able to study how how shapes kind of transform and, and morph through time is really fascinating seeing how snouts get longer and shorter or how the jaw gets more robust or more bendy those kind of shape analyses are really fascinating the most novel aspect of our work was the evolutionary rates analysis and this what we did was really a state-of-the-art thing using um, software called beige traits to look at how fast crocodile morphs evolved and that provides a really, really powerful tool to ask these questions about drivers of evolution and shifts in, in the evolution of morphology. And I definitely encourage people to, to follow that up and, and these methods can be applied very widely. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. It's been fascinating. That's great. Thank you for having me. It's been great to talk to you. All right. See you later, alligator. <laughs> You've been waiting for that. <laughs> I've been I've been planning that for a good few minutes. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking maybe before you, I think I think maybe before you even invited me on, you probably thought I can ask that at the, I can say that at the end. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a nice reward for anyone that's uh, stuck it through right until the very end of this conversation. <laughs> Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin-Silverstone with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall-Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.